you all for coming. It's uh, always great uh, when you give a talk, but there's some people in the audience that they're not. It's always a little bit of a bummer. Um, okay, yeah, I just learned today that uh, the only major in this college is in human ecology, which is an incredible uh, statement about your college. I'm going to start off with a metaphor. I'm a writer. Writers like metaphors. You know, it's a tool of the trade. So now as a storyteller, I start out with a visual metaphor, the balance ball. And every one of us, every moment of every day is on a balance ball, and we get to choose whether we want to live this moment as a moment of logic or this moment as a moment of magic. And we teeter. We all teeter, you know, we fall off the ball in one direction, we go in the other direction. We have moments that are very magical, and then we fall off the wagon and we, we go into logic. And, you know, we need both. I mean, I'm not uh, refuting logic. We all have computers and uh, drive cars and all that kind of stuff, and uh, we have to pay our taxes and all that. So I'm not saying logic should be thrown out the window always and forever. I'm just saying that there has to be, we have to be aware of the balance that we're on. Now, in our society at large, we have this kind of myth that magical moments are fine and dandy after we get our work done. But Really, you know, to, to get up in the morning and pay your mortgage and get, send your kids to school and, and get a job and enter the job market and all those things, you have to throw magic out the door because magic isn't what gets things done. This is what I'm here to refute. This is what the whole body of my life's work is about refuting. So now this story here that we're going to talk about occurred in Northeast Siberia. So let's get a feeling for Northeast Siberia. Let's go back into the Stone Age. People have lived in Northeast Siberia not for tens of thousands of years, but for hundreds of thousands of years. Homo erectus moved into not Northeast Siberia, but North Central Siberia a few hundred years thousand years before Homo sapiens existed. Okay, now we think, okay, how do you survive in Northeast Siberia? Well, you go out and you find, you find a stick or a rock or a piece of walrus husk and you tie it on the end of a long stick and you gather your buddies together and you go out and you hunt mammoths, okay? So now it's 50 below, it's dark, you're hungry and you're out there Okay, this is the kind of activity that you need, you know, a stick-throwing, spear-wielding male, a strong-throwing arm, a very practical, in a sense, in many senses, logical approach, pragmatic. So you would think that it is here that you would find the greatest reliance on left-brain logic and pragmatism. In fact, that's not true. It is here that I found the greatest reliance on magic. And we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about its relevance to human ecology. Okay, so I'm going to go back. Uh, we talked with John about Boulder, Colorado in the late 1960s. Uh, I was a, chemist uh, a graduate student in chemistry at the University of Colorado doing research on what holds molecules together, the quantum mechanical structure of organic molecules. At the same time, I was living in a teepee up in the mountains outside of Boulder. So um, teetering on the brink, going back and forth between the chem lab and living in the teepee and all that that entailed. All right, now, I'm going to go back N October 1, 1969. Now, this is a little tough because most of you are young. You might not have been around even at that time. But I'm, I've got two tickets here to the opening of Disneyland uh, in Novosibirsk in 2050 for the person 
who tell me what historical event happened October 1, 1969. That's relevant to this talk. Any takers? Yeah. Oh, many people have said that. You're wrong. <laughs> okay, any others? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Here come old flat top, he come grooving up slowly, he went Jew, Jew eyeballs. Yeah, Abbey Road came out. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, now, why was Abbey Road so significant? Okay, we were graduate students, and we felt honestly felt deep in our hearts that John Lennon was leading us across the road to a new spirituality, to a new relationship with ourselves. Human ecology, relationship to yourselves, relationship to your environments. And he was going to lead the way. And we were all going to follow. So six months later, Earth Day 1, April 22, 1970, I got together with several other people, three other people, and we wrote what became the first environmental science textbook in North America. Before that, there were no courses in environmental science or human ecology in the country. And what we felt as scientists, that it was, we weren't leading the way. The musicians, the poets, the writers, the thinkers, we're leading the way. We were just following because science isn't going to lead the way. Science is going to follow after the spiritual path has been led. Forty years ago. Forty years. And what's happened? Well, we haven't quite, we're not leaving for our generation and our, my children, my grandchildren, we're not leaving a better world than we inherited. I don't believe. We're leaving a, we were living in a certain amount of chaos that was created by ourselves. And as a writer, as an environmentalist for four decades, there's a certain amount of disappointment. So where do we go from here? Well, the answer to that question on a very simple level is we have to go back to the spiritual leadership first. Where does that spiritual leadership come from? After my years as an adventurer, I believe it comes from ancient wisdoms, from going back to the wisdoms of our distant ancestors. So along the way, I became an adventurer. And I paddled uh, in, in 1999 and 2000. I decided to paddle across the Pacific Rim from Japan across to Alaska. We didn't make this crossing for political reasons. The Americans wanted to charge us $25,000, and the Russians said they would shoot us. So <laughs> that was out. Um, it, it was a six months journey I, at 3,000 miles I, under expedition con conditions. I paddle about 500 miles a month. So 1,000 uh, miles the first year and 2,000 miles the second. We started off in uh, these boats. They're 16 feet, the same length as a traditional sea kayak, but they've got pontoons, they carry sail. They're, they're pretty fast. Uh, when the wind is in your favor, we, 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 we paddled out across, the, sailed out across the Kuril Islands and really got beat up by some of the most treacherous currents that I've ever been in. Um, at one point, we got caught in a whirlpool for 36 hours. Another point, we got washed out to sea for three nights, four days. So you were meeting the ocean in its most elemental level. There's no place to sit down, no place to go below. You're in a cockpit boat with a spray skirt like a sea kayak. And um, you're sitting there. There's no tent, no shelter. During storms, the waves are constantly inundating you. I've been on bivouacs on big granite walls in the Arctic. And there's nothing quite like the isolation of being in a kayak day and night through storm and daylight 
uh, in that vulnerability of the great ocean. It, it's really glorious. It's one of the most wonderful things, experiences you could ever have. We abandoned those boats and went to sea kayaks on the second half of the leg because we were in and out of the surf quite a bit. And the, the trimaran rig was kind of a dog in the surf. It, it had problems in the surf. This was a normal uh, day. This isn't a big storm day. This is a normal launch uh, in and out of the surf every day. There's no shelter along this coast. You have the full, it's not like the main coast where you have bays and inlets and fjords. It's a flat coast, and you have the full fury of the Pacific and the North Pacific and the Bering Seas coming at you. So, okay. This was fine. This was what we expected. This was what, what we were there for, for the adventure of a truly technical long distance ocean journey. Then we got into the ice. Now it's one thing to be dropping into the surf and making your move, you know, and, and cranking and, and taking your chance in the surf. It's another thing to have tractor trailer sized bits of ice rolling around in the surf with you. All of a sudden, at this point, it goes from fun technical sea kayaking to something that could kill you. So I want to give you a feeling of the isolation here. Supposing at this point we said, we quit. This isn't any fun anymore. This is too dangerous. We quit. It's all over. We're going to just pull the boats to shore, and we're going to start walking west until we find a paved road, we're going to hitchhike to town and get a salad bar, or check into a hotel or something. How far walking west would it take you before you get the paved road? Nine time zones. <laughs> Nine time zones. It's a long way. Siberia is a really big place. So, so that isn't really an option. So, so how, do you, how do you take care of this problem conceptually? Well, there's a saying we have in our society. When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does this imply? It implies when you get into a situation like this where you have ice in the surf, you tough it out. You close off. You growl. You charge yourself into the ice. I'm tough, man. I'm going to get going. Okay, this is much better. When the going gets tough, the tough sit down, they build a fire, you brew up a cup of tea, you think about it. Now, what does this mean? Well, what am I trying to say? Look, when you're in an environmental situation like this, in an expedition, all of a sudden, you're up against the power that is so awesomely huge, and there's so much force and power and energy in it, that getting tough is the most ridiculous concept I ever heard. You know, charging into it, butting into the ice. What you have to do first, you have to, like I say, stop, drink a cup of tea, accept the situation. Become at one with it. Understand that you're going to have to flow with it, that you're going to have to be part. You have to open yourself up to the whole gestalt of what's going on. You have to become friends with the ice. And then you have to move in this acceptance and this presence. You can't, it doesn't do you any good to be bummed out that the ice is there. That's a ridiculous concept. That's not going to help you survive. It doesn't do you any good to think about the fact that when you finish this trip, your sponsors are going to be happy and you're going to get articles and write books and, and you're going to make money. That's not going to do you any good. You have to be in the moment and at one with the ice. 
And this is what I'm talking about when I say magic. I'm not talking about sawing ladies in half or anything like that. I'm talking about feeling the magic of the moment. And when I say that magic is practical way of surviving, I'm talking from experience as an expedition person, 40 years in extreme places. It's the only way to stay alive. And it doesn't take much of a metaphor to expand that into, you know, school, economics, any field that you have, when the going gets tough, you have to feel the magic of that moment if you're going to survive it. Okay, so we're, we're paddling, we got through the ice, we're paddling north, and we were adjacent to this small village of Vivenka. This uh, was shot in the winter time, obviously not in the summer. But it's an isolated village, nine time zones from Moscow, perched on a sand spit. We're paddling on past. A big storm comes up. <laughs> and we decide we better land because it's time, you know, it's getting pretty nasty out there. So we land, and this woman is waiting for us in the beach. Her name is Lydia. She speaks a little English. It was the first English I had spoken with anybody but Misha for a while. She said, welcome. We are glad to see you. The grandmother caused the storm to bring you to our village. She wants to talk to you. <laughs> so what do you think? Well, I, well, I'll tell you what I thought. I thought, well, I'm a chemist from suburban Connecticut. I went to high school at Phillips Academy with George W. Bush. You know, this doesn't all compute. <laughs> But I also thought, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm strung out, I'm wet. There's a storm out there, yeah. I'm not here to be critical. I'm not here to be cynical. I'm not here to break this thing down in a logical manner. I said, of course, that's so wonderful. We'd love to see the grandmother. She ushered us into a warm house with a fire, with fresh bread baking, and so on and so forth. So the next day, we went up river to fish camp, and we met the grandmother. Moulinot, 96 years old at the time. She was born during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. She remembers the Bolshevik Revolution. She tells stories of being a little girl and there's trouble sweeping across the land. There's rumors of warfare and the Yankee traders are coming in sneaking in through the Russian networks, and they're bringing Winchester rifles to her people. And her father's down on the beach buying rifles. And she's a little girl standing on the hill watching that, feeling this ravage of war sweeping across her land. She lived through that. She lived through the entire rise and fall of the Soviet empire and through the horrible, horrible economic disruption caused by freedom by bandito capitalism. So I go, OK, now you roiled up the heavens. You caused the storm to bring the storm because you want to talk to me. What do you have to say? <laughs> but it was fishing season. You know, when you're talking to Koryak women, you have to wait till after fishing season because they're busy. <laughs> and so she told we were in a hurry because we had to get to um, Alaska before it got ice. the ice came in. So. She grasped me by the elbow and she said, John. And then she looked at my partner, Misha. She said, Misha, come back. It will be good if you do. And on that simple two sentences, both Misha and I changed our lives. We reoriented everything we had to do. And we decided to come back. And it turns out we came back repeatedly for the following five years to become immersed in this culture. So when we came back, um, the, the town of Ivenka, the, the people are fisher people because they fish for uh, salmon, the salmon run that goes up the river. And they also used to be reindeer herding people. Not long ago, they had 12,000 reindeer. Now they have zero. They lost them all. Poaching, bandito capitalism, illegal cap. Uh, illegal tax collectors, vodka, all the ravages of Western civilization. 
So she asked us to go out on the tundra and find the last few groups of reindeer herders who were migrating through the tundra and hiding. So here's this task. There's a, a, play, a, a, a stretch of land, like I say, nine time zones from east to west, like from here to California and back and back. And there's some people out there, and they're hiding. And go find them. <laughs> so we, we put 100 gallons. We, we, we got two, two drums of fuel, 100 gallons of gasoline, a couple of snowmobiles, snow machines. And uh, this group here, Olek, uh, the hunter, and by the way, he's, he turns out to be as, as great a teacher for me as anybody, uh, or certainly as great a teacher as Muna, Sergei, and the other Sergei. And we went off across the tundra. Um, this is Misha, my Russian partner, and Christine Seashore, my wife. And we wandered across the tundra in big arcs, and we found the reindeer people. And we hung out with them. And the book tells the story of how these people live and their visions of the world as they talk about it to us. I don't have the time or the inclination to tell the whole story because eventually, of course, I'd like you to read the book. So, okay, we're coming back. And previous to this, I had busted up my pelvis in an avalanche. It was a very serious injury. It was reduced uh, surgically. I was held together with a steel uh, titanium plate. I was sort of better, you know, sort of. On some days I could ski, and on other days when I had to go to the bathroom, I would crawl around the apartment to get to the bathroom. So before I went there, the, I went to the surgeon, and he said, well, John, yeah, we could f maybe fix you up. We'll another surgery, it'll be $30,000 and six months rehab, and maybe we'll fix you, and maybe we won't. And I said, no, I'm going to Siberia to shoot a film of the reindeer people, and he said, good luck. So, okay, we're coming back. It's April now. Uh, the sun is getting warm. The, the creeks are starting to break up. The ice is melting. The tundra is, is breaking up into spring, and we're driving one of the snow machines across a frozen creek, and the ice was thin, we dropped the machine into the creek. Okay, bummer, you know that we're on the tundra, this expedition is sort of standard operating procedure. I slide down, I'm muscling the machine out of the creek. I've got it in my arms, it's a heavy Russian machine, and I'm kind of walking over and I step on an icy rock and slip and land on one foot. Pelvis goes <laughs> I'm lying on the snow man, I can't walk. I'm in major pain. So, as I said, I had two great teachers in this uh, journey. Olek the hunter. Olek was with me, and it's like, hey, man, don't worry about it. You know, we're on the tundra. <laughs> Things break on the tundra, you know. Snow machines break, skis break, ropes break. You know, things break. We're on the tundra. Calm right down, you know. Well, everything's under control. We'll fix you up. I really didn't have any choice. You know, if I had had a satellite phone, I sure I would have called a helicopter, but it, that wasn't an option. So we, we drive back to the village. They tie me on the sled, and we start going back to the village. And um, it was a two, day, two days left to travel to the village, and we got one day of journey. And Sergey goes, hey, there's good fishing over here. So we stopped, and we went fishing for a little while. And then we made it back to the, see the grandmother. And we brought her some reindeer meat, and she was so delighted. And Oleg says, this man is, can you fix him? Because Mulanat's a shaman. She's a healer. So she had me take off all my clothes. She had me stand on one foot, put one arm behind my back, and hold the other arm straight out in front of me. And she said, I'm going to go to the other world and talk to Kutka, the raven god. And Kutka will fly to see the woman who lives on top of the highest mountain. And she will fix you. But you have to believe. If you don't believe, bad things are going to happen to me. Bad things will happen to Kutka. And by the way, 
very bad things will happen to you. <laughs> so it was sort of becoming a little bit of a mantra now. You know, I thought I'm a chemist from suburban Connecticut. I went to high school with George W. Bush. <laughs> this doesn't compute. I was feeling a little silly, you know. I was naked. I was standing on one leg. She stands about four feet, ten inches tall. She was staring at me. <laughs> I said, my mother never taught me to believe in kutka. My mother never taught me about your ways. But I'll try. And that was enough. And she started chanting in the old tongue, and suddenly I was balancing on a thin branch, wingtip to wingtip with the black raven flying to the other world. I was a Christmas tree, I was a Torah, I was a minaret, an axis mundi, a maypole, connected to the earth and reaching towards the heavens. And Mulanat told me I could put my foot down. And that confused me for a second because I forgot that I was standing on one foot. And then I put my foot down and I was better. Okay, I've given, this is like the 53rd time I've given this talk since the book came out. Inevitably, I get an email from somebody who says, Dear John, I am a civil engineer. I know right away or we're going to get in trouble. I don't believe you. I'm not asking anybody to believe anything. Okay, this isn't an exercise in belief. And I'm not giving away what happened in the book because here's what happened in my mind. It wasn't the healing that was important. It was for those few moments, I was transported my subconscious, my brain, was transported into a place that I had never been before. And I knew I had to go back. I couldn't just stop at this point. I had to understand where she had taken me. Forget about the healing. It's irrelevant. Don't argue about it with me. So, <laughs> I didn't mean to get aggressive, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we went back. And I went back and um, I came and I said, look, I came back to thank you. I had to have a reason for coming three quarters of the way around the world back to this remote reason because I'm a white man, you know. So I, my reason was I came to thank you and I brought her some nice warm socks and some gloves and a jacket and some nice things. And she said, well, you, thanking me is sort of irrelevant. You have to thank Kutka. And I went, oh, man, how do you do that? And she tried to transport me into the other world on a sp spirit journey. But as Olek told me, I'm a lousy traveler in the spirit world. So I had to make my journey in the real world. And here's the second great lesson of this book, is that the real world <coughs> and the dream world are the same. They take you to the same place. And this comes out of animistic religions where every bit of snow, every little bit of sastugi, every blade of grass, every raindrop, every snowflake is, has a soul as part of your spirit. So if you want to enter the spirit world, you can do it on the tundra. And we walked across the tundra. And we walked for a while and got cold got frostbitten, and had the north wind blow in our face and all those things. And we met these people. This is Daniela. She was um, connected up. He had just hooked up his dog team, and he was headed to town to pick up his Social Security check. He was all dressed up for the occasion. This is Nikolai. And we hung out with the reindeer people and told stories. And the book... The, the meat of the book, the important part of the book, is the stories of all these people and how they view their world and our world. 
And I'm going to read you one of these stories. This woman is named Marina. Marina stood up and walked into a dark corner and came back with a stick, almost like a war club, adorned with bits of fur, a rusted bent length of chain, beads, and a very dried up red fox hanging by its left hind foot and staring outward. Have people told you how we lost our reindeer, she asked shaking the club almost threateningly. Yeah, people told me that the Koryak lost their deer due to poaching, loss of markets, predation, and vodka. Ah, they told you what happened, but not why it happened. We lost our reindeer because we threw away our medicine sticks like this one. With this medicine stick, a small family can manage two to 3,000 reindeer, no problem. And without this stick, you cannot do this thing. Let me explain, there are devils on the tundra, wolf devils, people devils. They move like a herd clustered close together. The shaman must go to the devil's house and make trouble for the devils by hitting them with this stick. She almost struck me on the head and I, I started to duck but held, my, held her gaze. Marina held the medicine stick so the fox's eyes were staring into mine. Through those eyes I saw the tundra as it was when she was a little girl with tens of thousands of reindeer, with children playing, with girl mothers giving birth in snowy blizzards. Marina continued, the Koryak people lost their magic first. They lost their beliefs. They lost their shamans. They forgot that everything has magic. Everything. Do you hear me? They threw their magic sticks away. If you lose the magic in your life, then you lose your power. You must write this in your book. You must promise me. So this is the opposite lesson that we learn in our society. Now you're all students, I'm going to act out a scene from my childhood, from when I was a student. Okay, I was born in 1945. I was, um, in, I was in fourth grade in the mid 1950s so I, I don't want you to get confused, so I, I have a lot of characters in this short little skit. I want you to, I wear the different hats so you know who I am, okay? I'm Miss Maroney now, okay class? Everybody you with me? Okay, class, now. Uh, I'm so glad that you're all here and the attendance is good today. Um, tell me, let's think back to two million years ago when these ape-like creatures, these proto-humans, were coming down out of the trees onto the savanna. What was it about these ancestors of ours that was so special that led to the evolution of humans that we are today. So Billy raised his hand, he said, Miss Maroney, Miss Maroney, I think I have the answer. I think it's maybe because we had big brains. Oh, Billy, huh? You try so hard, but I worry about you sometimes. <laughs> Trying isn't good enough. You, you need the right answers. You're wrong. <laughs> and then Mary raised her hand and she said, Miss Maroney, Miss Maroney, I think I know the answer. Maybe it's because we had an upright stance and we lost our fur and somehow those qualities led to the evolution of humanity. Oh, Mary, 
You know, good looks will get you just so far in life. <laughs> and then you need the right answer. I'm so sorry, you're wrong. And then Ms. Maroney told us the answer. She explained that we had these marvelously dexterous hands with four fingers and a thumb counterposed against the four fingers. And with these marvelous dexterous hands, we could make tools. We could make weapons. We could go to war. We could go to Walmart and buy stuff that we didn't need. The problem is that Miss Maroney was wrong. We were holding paintbrushes in our hands. That's what we were doing with our marvelously dexterous hands. Yeah. If you go to the oldest site of Homo sapiens, the first time that we as physical anthropologists can look at what our species were doing, you know what we were doing? what every child would love to do, go to the beach, collecting seashells. Yeah, we were picking up seashells and drilling holes in them and making necklaces. We were coloring rocks. And all this came before sophisticated tools. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know that chimpanzees hold rocks in their hands and they crack nuts. And two million years ago, maybe even two and a half million years ago, we'd pick up a river cobble and hold it in our hand, something that fits smoothly into your hand and you could flake an edge on it, yeah. And you call that a hand axe. But that's not a sophisticated tool. And then we went for a long time with hardly advancing our tool technology at all. But we advanced our art, we advanced our music. We were creating temples, horizontal temples on the, on the earth where our tribe could dance to our shamans. If you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. Using very, very simple tools and our magic is what caused the evolution of human beings today. It was symbolism, myth, and dreams. It was when the dream world becomes indistinguishable from the real world. As I said at the beginning of this talk, we were all born in square houses. We all use computers and drive cars. Nobody was born in a Uranga on the tundra. There's a quality to living close to the earth that gives us a power that we can only get from the earth. You can't get it in any other way. When, when I first started going to Northeast Siberia, there were two old shamans alive. One of them lived down in Magadan, down closer to the forest, and she was getting ready to die, so she tried to transfer her power to somebody, but everybody, everybody alive, had been taken out of the tundra, off the, away from the Urangas, away from their connectivity to the earth, and taken into Soviet schools. Not one person could fully absorb the power of the Stone Age of this Stone Age woman. So she went out into the forest and she put her arm around a tree and she transferred all her power into the tree and the tree exploded and she died. So as I say, we can't go back in one generation and I'm not telling everybody to go live in the forest and caves on roots and berries, that's silly. But there's a need, I believe, to start the journey back at the same time we are moving forward, to feel the presence, to feel the connectivity to the earth, to, to learn from the earth at the same time we're working with it. 
And that's what I'm out talking about, and that's what my book is about. And I'm really honored to be here at College of the Atlantic because I think that in some great sense you all understand me. Thank you all very much. I do have books for sale afterwards. Um, what's our time frame here, John? Do we have time for questions? We've got plenty of time, sure. But if whoever wants to ask a question. Questions, discussion, yeah. So is there one shaman? In this part of Siberia, now, Siberia is so huge, I'm familiar with a little circle of about 200 kilometers around this one village. In this area, there's only one, and that's Mulanot. Now, down in Tuvid, down by Lake Baikal, they have shaman conventions. There's a whole shaman culture. And in Tibet and in Nepal, many other places in the world, but of this branch of shamanism, Mulanot's the only one left. Misha? Yes. Misha is, um, I, Misha's a hydrogeologist. He graduated with a master's degree in hydrogeology from the prestigious mining institute in St. Petersburg. He's an educated man. He's a businessman. Um, he has email. He lives in, uh, near Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. And I'm in communication with him fairly frequently. Um, his daughters, I was there through the formative years when his daughters were growing up. They email me about their new boyfriends. They're off in Western Russia going to college and so on. And um, I got to go back and see him. <laughs> How did you meet him originally? Um, well, on the first leg of our journey, we had a Russian guide, a liaison officer, and uh, we got out to see and he immediately realized that this was a job from hell. And he quit and uh, got to a Russian military base and got out of there. So we went on without him. And we got in all kinds of trouble. You know, you land on the beach and they, they come down with AK-47s and guard dogs and they run around, you know, you're evil Americans attacking the soft underbelly of Mother Russia. And so you put your hand on your head and all that. And, and then, uh, you know, you. You wait until everything calms down, and an hour later, you're all drinking vodka and stuff like that because it's really the Cold War is kind of silly, and we all know that. Anyway, we um, we finally got to PK, and the Pogranichniki, the Russian shock guard, said, "Well, now if you go on, you really have to have a guide." And Misha showed up, and he said, uh, "I am making too many papers. I want to go to the wild nature." <laughs> And um, this whole story of the two-year journey is talked about in my book, In the Wake of the Jomen. And then the furthering, which is the, the more in-depth time I spent with Mulanot, is told about in The Raven's Gift. Yeah? I'm really concerned about this, um, the magic. I don't, I understand your question, I don't know how I can answer it. Um, look, languages and cultures are being driven to extinction all across the world, and they have been for a long time. It's not just happened in Russia, it's happened everywhere. When you lose a language, you lose the ability to communicate with the spirits in the ancient way. And, that, and then the, shaman, the shamanism, the shamanic culture becomes destroyed. I don't know how it's all going to play out, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm asking is that we're aware of the power of this and the importance of it. 
and each person in their own way do what they can that we don't anesthetize these centers of wisdom. There are still shamans, a lot of shamans around in different cultures. And we as a culture, as a Western culture here in Maine, have to, each person, not have to, but we want to think about not anesthetizing other forms of wisdom. Yeah. Why do you think, why do you think there is such a push to modernize and only use the logical side of our thinking? Oh boy, <laughs> you're going to get me going here. <laughs> uh, uh, do you want my honest answer or do you want my anesthetized answer? <laughs> I, look, you know, um, run me out of town on a um, tar and feather me and run me out of town. I think that the world is controlled to a very large part by a relatively small number of rich, greedy people who run the corporations. And they have it in their economic interest to anesthetize us. I could talk about this for a while more, but you get the idea. And I think that, th that they have an amazing control. And it's to their advantage that if they anesthetize us, then they get richer, rich, greedy people. So I think that a very important component of what we do is to, I think that the corporate, the corporate culture is more dangerous than we think it is. And what we, the first thing we have to do is not believe not believe them. Find your own way. Do you find any middle ground during your travels? Um, with your background in organic chemistry and logic, so to speak, and mm. that your experience in that country, do you ever find maybe a, a meshing of stories? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, these questions. These questions here, this is great. These are really good questions. Of course there's a middle ground. Of course there's a middle ground. Look, we have two hemispheres of our brain for a reason. There's an evolutionary reason why we have this very complex two hemisphere brain. Um, according to the best information that I can read that um, the Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, but they didn't have the kind of hemisphere split and, and the left and right brains working together, working towards a common goal. But we people in North America here apparently use about 85% left brain and 15% right brain. So it's not a matter of magic, you know, like I say, going and becoming a shaman on the tundra or, um, you know, going down to the jungle and, and, and being lost in shamanic traditions down in Ecuador or being a um, software engineer on the other side. It's all part of an integration that each person has to find the integration that works for them, but it is an integration. The only thing I think it's a good idea is to peek every once in a while as deeply into the magic as you can, just to know it's there. Just take a look every once in a while when you get a chance. Yeah. Um, do you think there's been any uh, movement in the situation of these uh, tribes in Siberia since you visited? Improvement. Or, or any change? Oh, that's a hard one. Because I don't know really what the word improvement means. Or, or you know, maybe... See, economically, they're in a big, still in a big battle with the corporations over fish, over value of fish, the price of fish. These people, at the same time, to answer your question, at the same time that they're still trying to retain their magic, they're also... Yeah, I guess improvement in that sense of retention. Well, at one, at one level, it, it's the answer to your question. At one level, they're, they want to retain 
their culture and their magic. At the other level, if they catch fish, they want a fair price for the fish. And they want to buy new snow machines. And they want their electricity to work. So they're in this battle that we're all in with themselves, with their own balance between magic and logic, and with the corporate world that's out there trying to steal their fish for them. I haven't been there for five years, and things happen in Siberia a lot in the last five years. To really answer your question, I have to go back. How are we doing on time, John? As much as you want to be. What is, Okay, well, we'll go for a few more questions. These are good questions. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, a theme seems to be, or you seem to have it in um, your head, that, that there is some force out there that is that can stop us from um, experiencing the world this way, perhaps, or just trying to dissuade us. is necessary. Thank you. Consider the two, the two different poles. Okay? On one hand, you believe that the fundamental basis of our humanity is our tools <laughs> and how much we can buy at Walmart. <laughs> and when you believe that, then the coal mine becomes acceptable. And then the corporate people who make a coal mine that's going to blow up and kill 24 miners, that's acceptable too. Because it leads to greater profits. And if you believe, on the other hand, that our relationship with the earth, that our presence, that our spiritual wellness, that our believing in the moment is what comes more important, then if somebody says to you, we want to save this wetland, we don't want a shopping center there, but it's going to cost it's going to cost society a certain amount of money. You say, okay. You say, okay, we have to save this wetland, even if it costs us money as society. And collectively, if we put these spiritual reasons first, then we can build a sustainable planet that we can pass on for generation after generation after generation. And collectively, if we put our profits first, and our things and our possessions and our um, logical systems first, then we have the right to destroy the planet for next year's corporate balance sheet. So the difference is critical. It's, it's the life and death of our society is the difference. It's not a small difference. Yeah? Why did you write these books? Huh. For one, I'm a writer. Writers like to write. That's probably the main reason. Um, this is who I am. It's what I do. I'm happy when I'm writing. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to get out here and, and, and get stomping around as like I'm uh, the chosen one, but there was a certain element here that this story needs to be told. If 
you lose the magic in your life, then you lose your power. You must write this in your book. You must promise. So there's a certain element that these people asked me to write the book. So I wrote the book. Yeah? Um, do you think the grandmother would be satisfied with the book that you ended up writing? Do I think who? Sorry, the grandmother would be satisfied with uh, the book? <laughs> I'm going to go to Russia and take her the book. Um, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I guess you can't really answer anymore. I, I can't really answer that. Um, several people told me at one point when I was in a reindeer camp and these people were telling me all these stories of their magic and their sh shamanism and I said, why are you telling me this story? I'm a writer. What do you want me to do this information? Can I put it in the book? Is this a secret? And they said, you walked here. If anybody's going to tell our story, you're the one who, ha who can tell it. So I've hoped to tell the story honestly. I've hoped I've done the best job I could. Yeah, we'll take two more and then we'll call it good. I just was wondering, I'm sure that there are a lot of people here who've had a taste, a vision into the magic that you're talking about, that you have also experienced. Um, myself, I'm not going to kayak the ocean around, but I've had these experiences and I wonder how you, for yourself, cultivate your ongoing contact with that place. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody hear that? How to cultivate the ongoing, um, the ongoing experience. First of all, the first, the first thing is not to expect a repeat of what happened to me as if it's some sort of achievable goal. If you get hung up on, I want this to happen again, I'm going to go do this and that, and I'm going to hope for it to happen, and if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be a bummer. This would be missing the point entirely, okay? I think... And it is. It's an ongoing. It's an ongoing journey. Nina and I, Nina and my wife here in the corner, we're talking about this on the drive up. It's an ongoing journey. It's a journey with no end. I think that because you, ha I have felt. I've had some moments of mindfulness and some moments of presence, and I have seen it. I know that there's a place I can keep trying to get to. I also know that I'm going to fail on certain days or weeks or months. But knowing that it's there and, you know, you look out at the world and something happens. In January, when I started this road trip, I was packing the truck. I was in southeastern British Columbia, and I was packing the truck. It was a winter day in January in British Columbia. And I was um, loading the truck up for this two months journey, and a raven came and flew overhead and circled the truck and cawed three times and flew away. Well, you know, it's a, I live, there's a lot of ravens that live in British Columbia. It could be a coincidence, a raven, that just ha seemed to happen, happen. But I, I felt like the raven was saying goodbye to me. Good luck, Shasliva. Shasliva, good luck. Have a good journey. Thanks for making the journey for me. That's the way I interpreted it. And I think... It's looking, it's, it's taking the moment when you, when it, when it happens and letting yourself go on that journey as often as you can, being aware that it exists. And choosing to interpret what it happens to you from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and if I'm wrong, that's my problem. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter. It's just... If I'm talking to the universe and I think the universe is talking back to me, that's just my own personal relationship with that universe. But aren't you, aren't you actually 
saying that that personal relationship with the universe is shaping the nature of the universe? Is what? Shaping the nature of the universe that we're in. Isn't that your argument? That believing in that connection of magic is what changes the nature of the world we're in. In the direction of magic. Toward the direction of magic. Wow, that's a tricky one. Um, I think, and you know, we could sit down over a couple of beers and talk about this for a while, but I think that the important, at least the immediate important step is that if I feel I have this relationship with the universe, I'll be less eager to dig coal mines and to destroy it that I'll be more eager to preserve it. So there's a mechanical thing. If I have a spiritual relationship with the universe, if I think that the mountain has a soul, I'll be less willing to call in a bulldozer to bulldoze the mountain away. So it, that's a physical thing. Your question was more on a more cosmic level, and I'm not sure I can answer that real quickly. Are we OK here? Let's go one more question. Yeah, I'll give it to John here. <clears throat> what did you uh, take as the raven's gift? Well, what was the raven's gift? On the short level, the raven uh, flew to talk to the woman who lived on the highest mountain and healed my pelvis, and I'm better. My pelvis is all better. I can ski. On the, on the more cosmic level, it's just what I've been talking about, that the raven gave me the gift of being able to step outside of the stories that are in my head, of the stories of past and present and all this commotion that lives in my head, and giving me the gift of, hopefully, the intention, the desire, hopefully to live in that presence and live in that communication with the earth. That's what the gift is. Okay, thank you all very much.